Uh, hello, Arkady. It's good to see you here in Oslo. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, NUP interview about Russia and uh, the EU. As you know, my name is Jakub Godzimirski, and I am a research professor here at NUPI. And I have uh, together with me Dr. Arkady Moshes, who is the program director of the EU Eastern Neighborhood and Russia Research Program at the Finnish Institute of uh, International Affairs. The plan today is to talk about relations between Russia and the EU in the context of the Ukrainian crisis. Clearly, the Russia-EU relations have dramatically deteriorated since the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis. But could you say a few words about how this uh, relationship uh, looked like before the November last year? Thank you, Jakob, and let me thank the Institute for the invitation to, uh, to have this conversation with you. Uh, well, as to the question, it was pretty clear already before November 2013 that the Russian-European relationship was going down. This was a downward spiral. The Zenith, the best point of Russia-EU relations, was the St. Petersburg summit that took place in summer 2003. Mm. After that, the strategic picture was clear. Uh, things kind of between the two worked less and less. Uh, there was a value gap, uh, which was only growing. Uh, there was no econ economic conversion uh, as concerns the rules. Russian WTO membership only created more problems. The energy partnership more looked like the tug of war when neither side was satisfied and both were looking for the ways to diversify exports for Russia and imports for the European Union. Uh, the relationship in the common neighborhood were a zero-sum game and a geopolitical rivalry. Uh, there was no or very little cooperation on foreign policy issues as concerns the third uh, countries. There was very little chemistry left between the leaders of the European countries and Russia, and so on and so forth. So this, this, the list can be extended. Uh, the problem also was that the EU had a problem admitting uh, that the relationship was in a strategic crisis. It was looking for some initiatives like this uh, Partnership for Russia's Modernization, which was stillborn and could not work because Russia was only interested in the technology transfer and not in the societal transformation, what was the EU idea. Anyway, the relationship was, a, was in crisis, but it took the dramatic events of uh, the autumn of 2013 uh, before the EU would realize that. Namely, could you tell us a few words about what happened when uh, President of Ukraine, Yanukovych, decided to turn down the invitation to strengthen relations with uh, the European Union. This was the beginning of this uh, crisis. Uh, well, many things happened. The most important thing happened, of course, inside Ukraine. It's when the indignation of people against the Yanukovych rule, uh, and we should say that Yanukovych had no defenders inside the country. He had a conflict practically with everybody, with civil society, with most of the oligarchs for different reasons. So basically, the only people that were ready there to stand by him were the ready bound by the oath. It's the people in the uniform, and not all of them even. So the indignation of people against the Yanukovych regime uh, was kind of united with people's feelings uh, to become part of Europe or to get the European perspective which they thought were betrayed or even ruined by his decision. So uh, his re refusal to sign the association agreement with the EU, there was a trigger. Uh, it, this, this event uh, was, it, it had a kind of a cumul, by that moment the contradictions accumulated. So this, this became the last drop and people went out to the streets. We see that uh, this crisis that was uh, to start with a kind of internal Ukrainian crisis developed into a kind of um, conflict between Russia and the West. Uh, how could you describe uh, the relationship between the EU and Russia today in the aftermath of this crisis? Again, it's true. The, the internal Ukrainian crisis became a catalyst of opening uh, the conflict between Russia and the West, of bringing it into the open. But uh, as I said, it had existed before. Uh, the relationship now is, of course, uh, as it's at its lowest, um, probably since the end of Cold War. This is not accidental. This is not surprising. Uh, the, as we see, the rhetoric coming from Moscow uh, is basically the rhetoric of a country at war. Mm. What Mr. Putin is trying to say, that the most powerful coalition mm. of the world, led by the United States, mm. Uh, and uh, the United States followed by the Europeans, 
uh, are trying to uh, basically destroy Russia, uh, that uh, the Ukrainian crisis was only in a pretext, and without the Ukrainian crisis, uh, there would have been another pretext for the West to basically start this new war against Russia. These are very serious accusations. Mm -hmm. And if this is what Kremlin really means, and we have reasons to believe that, this, that it is so, then uh, we have no other uh, kind of uh, right analytically to describe this relationship as a relationship in a deep, 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 deep crisis. And uh, we have reasons to believe that this crisis will deepen, that what we are witnessing now amidst the events in Ukraine is not the culmination, is not the top, but it's just the local peak. So people should be preparing for really a long period of very bad relations between Russia and the West, including Europe. This crisis was triggered by Ukraine's wish to strengthen relations with the European Union. But do you see any differences between the Russian relations with the European Union on the one hand and the United States and NATO on the other hand? Or do they look at all those two organizations as a part of the West? Yes, I mean, there are differences. Mm -hmm. One difference is fundamental. This is uh, the economic interdependence. Despite the fact that we have a comprehensive crisis, which is also undermining uh, the economic underpinning of this relationship, the economic independence is still alive and it exists. And without uh, Russia's energy exports to Europe and Europe's necessity to buy this energy, I believe uh, that the, the situation would be much worse than that. Uh, so the economic interdependence is still there, and that, that constitutes a really, really principal difference between the Russian-European relations on the one hand and Russian-American relations on the other hand. But the other difference is actually no less uh, serious, and this is something which is underestimated by the Europeans. Uh, the, this is this difference is psychological, but it now grows uh, into a, it, it has a political dimension. Namely, uh, Russia respects the United States. Mm. Moscow basically sees and let the others understand that in the current world, there are not so many fully sovereign countries. Mm. One of them is Russia. It's a country which can take its own decisions and does not tolerate or accept dictate. Another country is the United States, and the third country is China. Mm. And certainly, European countries do not uh, have the status of sovereignty in Moscow's official perceptions. Mm. Uh, it is believed that their decisions are dictated from behind the Atlantic Ocean. Mm. Uh, and uh, even within uh, the Union, kind of the bigger countries uh, can impose uh, their will on smaller countries. Therefore, this is not a sovereign entity. And as we know from history, uh, when Russia uh, expresses, or at least even just has, uh, some kind of uh, disrespectful attitude to the countries that it deals with, it normally does not help uh, to solve the crisis. You have already mentioned that uh, there is a very strong economic interdependence between Russia and uh, the European Union, for instance, in the field of energy. But um, we have seen that uh, the West has um, tried to make Russia play another game by imposing some sanctions. How do you assess the impact of the sanctions on Russia on the one hand, but also uh, of the counter sanctions that have been imposed by Russia against uh, the Western European countries? Uh, how do you see the impact of the sanctions? Well, I guess uh, one thing is axiomatic. Mm. Russian economy is probably eight to 10 times smaller than that of Europe, and it's about 20 times smaller than that of the uh, aggregated West. Mm. So uh, the asymmetry uh, is simply there. It's, it's, it, stick, it sticks out. We don't need to uh, explain this, that Russia will be uh, suffering from these sanctions a lot more. You, don't, you see in the West that certain sectors of the economy uh, are affected. In different countries, they are affected differently. In different countries, are affected differently. But uh, this is a question, after all, for the European solidarity. Because if the EU has solidarity, indeed, it should be able to really cope fairly easily with the effects of the Russian counter sanctions. You cannot say the same about Russia. And uh, of course, again, the sanctions, uh, it's very difficult actually to estimate what is the actual effect of the sanctions. 
because they have procyclical uh, effect. In fact, Russian economy was slowing down. Now that the oil goes down and the ruble plunges, I mean, it, it, it all kind of binds together. But definitely, uh, the life of, a, of a, quite a number of Russian companies that will not be able to take loans uh, in the Western capital markets and interstate loans for that matter. And even the companies which are not uh, formally under the sanctions, but still uh, doing their risk assessment, the Western banks will probably now be a bit restrained uh, in, uh, in, in giving them the loans that they might be willing to seek. So uh, the effects are there. Uh, it will take time. Uh, this, is, this is like pouring water onto the porous rock. Uh, you, you don't have to see an immediate effect, but the effects are there. Economic effects will definitely be there. Will they be translated into political effects? That's too early to say, and I would not be predicting that, because there might be a different effect, a rally around the flag, a consolidation uh, of the nation around the leader uh, who would then claim the legitimacy of the national leader in a country at war. But the economic effects will be quite profound and, uh, and asymmetrical. We know that uh, energy cooperation is one of the backbones of this uh, cooperation between Russia and the EU. How could we understand the decision on, uh, made by President Putin to stop the development of the South Stream uh, project that was one of the strategic projects that was to be realized by Russia? Uh, well, I think it's a rational decision. Uh, people are saying that uh, Russia has already invested $5, billions, $5 billion, which will, it will now have to write off. This is not necessarily the case. If uh, part of this capacity will be used for extending pipelines going to Turkey, uh, but certainly it's better to lose $5 billion than to lose $25 billion. Mm -hmm. Russia wanted to build this new pipeline uh, basically um, we, 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 if only if two things would be secured, or maybe on the other hand, to secure two things. One, to circumvent Ukraine. Mm -hmm. in, that, uh, in those circumstances and from in, in that context, this um, project was acquiring a geopolitical dimension. But uh, it makes less sense now to circumvent Ukraine because the crisis in Ukraine has now reached such dimensions that uh, a bypass pipeline uh, no longer makes a difference, frankly. Mm -hmm. The other thing which was there to be achieved was uh, to increase its presence in the energy sectors of the South and uh, to be able actually to dictate to the European Commission and other European watchdogs that Russia is so big that it is worth to be given exemptions mm -hmm. from the general laws. Mm -hmm. This is not the view of the Europeans. Mm -hmm. So basically, if Russia has to build this pipeline, but then the pipeline become a subject of the third energy package of the European Union, uh, Russia becomes disinterested in that. This is not what it wants, and in that sense, this decision is logical, and I think it's actually, it's actually good for all the potential investors, also on the European side. As you mentioned, uh, to start with, uh, the, we have seen uh, a very clear deterioration of uh, relations between Russia and the European Union in the wake of this uh, crisis in Ukraine. But uh, could you share your insights and your ideas about how those relations can be improved, uh, what has to be done in order to uh, somehow repair the damage that has been done over the last uh, couple of uh, years? I don't have the insights, mm -hmm. but more importantly, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we are not yet in the situation mm -hmm. where we could credibly claim the knowledge mm -hmm. uh, of how this relationship could be improved. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I don't think that the crisis uh, has kind of gone through its lowest point. Uh, this is a fundamental crisis. Mm -hmm. This is a crisis of the rules which were governing the security system of Europe mm -hmm. since 1945. Mm -hmm. And by uh, doing small things like, for instance, potentially launching the dialogue between the European Commission and the Eurasian Economic Commission, or discussing maybe issues of cooperation on such dossiers as Iran, for instance, or Middle East in general, I mean, you can probably hope to um, gain and secure some positive dynamics on the specific issues. 
but the Ukrainian question will, st will still stick out. Uh, there is a fundam the, the fundamental question is still there. Is it possible and acceptable in the 21st century to annex parts of territories of other countries? The improvement of the relations would now imply that the West would say yes. Hmm. Well, not 100% yes, but under certain circumstances, yes. Uh, and I don't think the West is ready for that. Therefore, I think it's, it's really, it's probably too early to start preparing a blueprint of how this relationship can be improved. We are not yet there. Thank you very much for sharing Thank your you. deep insights on Russian foreign policy. And uh, it was really a pleasure to have you here. Thank Pleasure you. equally. Thank you. Thank you.